hadirin sekalian, forum ketiga akan bermula sebentar sahaja lagi. Diminta agar para hadirin mengambil tempat duduk. Assalamualaikum dan selamat tengah hari. Sesi forum ketiga akan bermula sebentar lagi. Dipersilakan ahli panel untuk forum ketiga untuk mengambil tempat di atas pentas. Hadirin yang dihormati, sesi forum pada petang ini adalah suatu sesi perbincangan mengenai isu semasa iaitu marijuana untuk perubatan adakah Malaysia bersedia. 
Bagi mengupas isu ini bersama-sama kita adalah tiga orang ahli panel yang berpengetahuan luas di dalam bidang ini iaitu yang berhormat Dr. Kelvin Yi Li Yuan, Ahli Parlimen Bandar Kuching, Tuan Sutekno Ahmad Belon, Dr. Nur Azalia Kamar Zaman. Perbincangan ini akan dikendalikan oleh yang berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Muhammad Syafi'i Abdullah sebagai moderator. Yang berbahagia Tan Sri merupakan timbalan Presiden Pertubuhan Alumni Rumpun Fakulti Undang-Undang Universiti Melaya, Parfum, bagi sesi 2021-2022. Seorang tokoh yang berpengalaman luas dan mempunyai kepakaran dalam bidang perlembagaan, hak asasi manusia dan undang-undang berkaitan jenayah dan fitnah. Yang berbahagia Tan Sri memulakan karya dalam bidang guaman sebagai timbalan pendakwa raya di Jabatan Peguam Negara. Selepas samat ijazah sarjana pada tahun 1985, beliau memulakan Masses Syafi'i Co yang masih lagi bergiat aktif sehingga kini. Tanpa melengahkan masa lagi, saya serahkan forum kita kepada yang berbahagia Tan Sri. Dipersilakan. Assalamualaikum dan selamat tengahari kepada semua yang hadir. Oleh sebab Sesi ini agak berlainan. Dia melibatkan bukan sahaja tiga, tiga orang ahli panel di sini secara live. Ia juga melibatkan tiga lagi ahli yang akan masuk di dalam perbincangan ini dengan cara Zoom ataupun dengan video klip yang telah pun dikemukakan pada pagi ini. Mereka-mereka ini daripada luar negeri Uh, saya bacakan nama mereka. Pertamanya ialah Steve D'Angelo, uh, globally recognized sebagai se seorang cannabis leader and founder of Last Prisoner Project. Kedua, seorang uh, warga negara Malaysia uh, yang sekarang telah pun uh, uh, jadi permanent resident di California, uh, Tengku Chanela Jamidah. Seorang founder Halal Ham Organisation dan HalalHam.com. Uh, beliau memang selalu uh, bekerjasama dengan Steve D'Angelo dan uh, seorang lagi individu, individu yang ketiga iaitu Sheikh Mustafa Umar, Director of Education and Outreach at the Islamic Institute of Orange County and founder and director of the California Islamic University, executive member of the Fiqh Council of North America. This is in relation to uh, halal cannabis and, and the uh, various aspects that you will hear from him. Now, panelist tempatan yang ada bersama-sama saya hari ini, uh, pertama, uh, yang berhormat Dr. Kelvin Yi Li Yuan, Ahli Parlimen Bandar Kuching. Kedua, Encik Sutekno Ahmad Balun, Ketua Pengarah Agensi Anti Dadah Kebangsaan dan Dr. Nur Azalia Kamaruzaman, Pengarah Pusat Racun Negara. Oleh sebab um, sesi pada tengah hari ini melibatkan uh, tiga Uh, panelis yang lain daripada luar negeri uh, yang semuanya hanya bertutur dalam bahasa Inggeris uh, saya akan membuka sesi ini uh, mungkin lebih ke menjurus kepada bahasa Inggeris tetapi tidak semestinya 100% kepada bahasa Inggeris siapa yang nak bercakap dalam bahasa Melayu you are most welcome uh, uh, you, you certainly can, 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 can do that so dengan ini Uh, I'm going to do something abnormal. I'm going to ask my assistant here in Parliament. Uh, I now have an assistant in Parliament, which is very good. Uh, <laughs> perhaps uh, we can get um, Augustine to play the first video clip. After these three clips of three different videos are played, we will then come to our uh, speakers uh, that are here with us uh, live. All right? Can we start with the first one?
Honorable Members of Parliament, Officers and Members of Parfum, Moderator Tan Sri Shafi, Salamat Sejatra, and I would like to say Terima Kasi to all of you who have come here today to hear the good news about cannabis. My name is Steve D'Angelo. I've devoted my life to telling the truth about this plant. I've been an entrepreneur, an educator, an investor, a business person, and a speaker. My friend, Willie Brown, former speaker of the California Assembly, called me the father of the legal cannabis industry because of the leading role that I played in the birth of legal cannabis in the first state in which it became legal in the United States, California. Today, I would like to focus just on a couple of the very many facts about cannabis. Mother Nature was incredibly generous and wise when she gifted this plant to us, because at one time, it will awaken our spirits, heal our bodies, and give to us the raw materials that we need to build a new life-affirming industrial economy. The first fact that I would like to share with you about cannabis today is the endocannabinoid system. This system is the largest neurotransmitter system in the human body. It turns out that the human body endogenously, internally, produces many of the same chemical compounds that are produced by the cannabis plant. When these plants are produced by the plant, they are known as phytocannabinoids. When they are produced by the human body, they are known as endocannabinoids. There are literally hundreds of different cannabinoids, and every single one of them that has been studied has some type of therapeutic effect. The endocannabinoid system is the neurotransmitter system that manages the cannabinoids in the human body. This system is present in our brains, in all of our bodily organs, in our skin, in our connective tissue. It is present in our immune system, our autoimmune system, our circulatory system, almost every single bodily support system in the human body. Wherever the endocannabinoid system is, it plays the same role. It maintains and preserves, and when necessary, restores homeostasis. Homeostasis is just the body's place of natural balance. One example of a homeostatic effect in the human body is shivering. When the human body becomes too cold in an environment, it starts having involuntary muscle movements. These muscle movements create body heat, which then raise the temperature of the body to protect it from the cold environment. Flushing is also a homeostatic response. Blood vessels underneath the skin expand in response to a warm environment. And as those blood vessels expand, they rise to the surface of the skin where they can help cool the body down. The way that cannabis works on almost any disease that you can imagine is related to this homeostatic effect. One example is cancer. The way that cannabis fights cancer is by restarting the process of apoptosis, natural cell death, that cancer interrupts. And at the same time, cannabis also slows and then stops the process of angiogenesis, which is the process by which cancer tumors appropriate blood vessels normally intended for other purposes in the human body. So it's this very elegant one-two punch with cannabis and cancer, where it blows up the cancer cells from the inside and starves them from the outside without harming any of the surrounding tissue, without any of the kind of damage that you see or the side effects from chemotherapy or radiation. You see the same similar type of effect with cannabis with a wide range of other very grave illnesses like epilepsy and multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's. I saw that firsthand with my mother who had Alzheimer's. So very, very potent medicine.
for almost any ailment. Cannabis is also a remarkable industrial raw material. The basic fact here is that anything that can be made out of petroleum, out of trees, or out of cotton can instead be made out of hemp. And when we make products out of hemp, there's an incredibly powerful environmental impact, positive environmental impact. First is because hemp, when harvested, sequesters 20 metric tons of atmospheric carbon for every hectare of cannabis that's harvested. Many of the products that are made out of hemp, like hempcrete, will continue to sequester atmospheric carbon over their lifetime. Hemp grows well without pesticides, without fertilizers, without chemical inputs. In fact, hemp can be planted on contaminated land and it will suck the poisons out of that land. It is a natural phytoremediator, first used for this purpose at the Chernobyl nuclear disaster zone in the Ukraine. Um, now, uh, uh, it has been used in many, many different sites all over the world for this purpose to pull nickel out of the soil, cadmium, a wide range of various different toxic materials. Lately, new research is being done that's tremendously exciting that expands the range of what we think we will be able to make out of hemp. And I will close with the most exciting of these new discoveries. One of the main drivers of new renewable technology, one of the main ingredients in photovoltaic products like solar panels, is a product called graphene. It is a semiconductor material that is currently harvested in Africa and, and other countries at great social and environmental costs. It turns out that instead of being harvested in conflict zones, at outrageous prices with terrible human and environmental consequences. You can instead make graphene out of hemp and you can make it at such scale and so inexpensively that now there is a company that is considering making skins for houses, for automobiles, for ships, for trains, graphene skins that would cover the entire outsides of these structures and would be one great big photo Voltaic collective. Could you imagine a whole city full of buildings, a whole city full of vehicles, a whole city full of roofs, all of them, all of them drawing power from the sun. This is the future that hemp offers us. I wish you the very best with your hemp education. Please feel free if I can ever be of help in the future. Do not hesitate to contact me. Be well and stay free. Thank you. That was uh, Steve D'Angelo. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. First of all, I would like to thank all the members of parliament and other attendees for being here and for allowing me to speak at Malaysia's parliament house on this important topic. Uh, the topic is about cannabis. And I'll tell you a little bit about my story. I am an executive member of the Fig Council of North America. And I was commissioned to write a paper on what we call in America medical marijuana or medical cannabis. Um, and I'll be very honest with you. Uh, when I began uh, the paper and when I began the research, my understanding was that there are many Muslim youth uh, who smoke cannabis and they you know they smoke marijuana in order to get high they want to get euphoric they you know they want to get uh, they just want to have fun and uh, of course this is prohibited in Islam uh, what's surprising is that there are some young Muslims who would never drink alcohol or eat pork but they will still smoke marijuana somehow justifying that it's okay even though they're getting intoxicated so my understanding was that you know what, uh, people are talking about this uh, trend of medical cannabis somehow being good for you just as a smokescreen, as an excuse to get high so that they could justify uh, the haram things that they're doing. But I was very surprised when I began my research because it turned out to be 
quite different from what I expected it to be. So I thought I was going to write a paper basically saying, yeah, there's no, there's no med medical benefits. This is all, this is all an excuse for people to just get high and, and use drugs. But in reality, I started looking at the modern literature and I realized that, hey, there are people who are going through chronic pain, they're going through sleep issues, they're going through so many things and they're using so many other types of medicine, uh, opiates and things like that, which are horrible for them. There's so many side effects. Uh, and they also cause some levels of, you know, euphoria, intoxication, so many other potential issues. Whereas uh, some cannabis concentrations, particularly CBD, uh, which cannot make you high, uh, it cannot cause any sense of uh, intoxication or, you know, uh, euphoria. Uh, it's not psychoactive. Uh, didn't have those side effects. So when it came to the modern literature, I, I was very surprised to read about that. And then I said, well, let me take a look at what the classical fiqh, Islamic law literature, has to say. So I looked at a book called Kashf al dhunun by Haji Khalifa. It's a very well-known book uh, among Muslim scholars. It's a book which basically documents all the old classical books in the Islamic library, like that have been written throughout, you know, over a thousand years. And he mentions under hashish, which is produced by the cannabis plant, it's also similar to what we call marijuana. I know that term is not you know, uh, politically correct all the time, but this is what we still use over here uh, often. So I looked at that and he mentions that there are six essays that were written by Muslim scholars that he came across on the topic of hashish. And one of the ones that I came across and I decided to go look at was a, an essay called uh, Zahrul Arish fi Tahrim al Hashish by Imam al Zarkashi, who lived about you know several hundreds, several centuries ago. He's a very well known Shafi'i scholar, a specialist in the Shafi'i school of thought in fiqh, which I know many people in Malaysia follow the, the Shafi'i school. So I found it to be very interesting because Imam al Zarkashi he writes this long essay about how hashish is destroying the Muslim community. People are using these drugs. We need to ban it. We need to stop it. And I was like, yeah, that's right. Just, just like what's happening with weed and marijuana and you know people smoking cannabis and everything like that. And then near the end of the essay, he talks about the medical benefits of hashish. And I was shocked and I was surprised. And the reason why I was surprised is not only is it a most classical Muslim scholar that's saying that, but it's a, a Shafi'i scholar who's saying that, and the Shafi'i school is known to be a little bit harsher on issues like this in particular when it comes to certain food and when it comes to uh, using medicine on something that could potentially intoxicate you. And he still said it's okay, and then he started quoting other Shafi'i scholars saying it's okay. And then he quotes Imam al-Qarafi, a Maliki scholar, then he quotes Sheikh ibn Taymiyyah. And I go and check all of these sources, and I was surprised. And I said, wow, this is really interesting. So I did a long write-up about it, and I gave it back to the Fiqh Council of North America. And what they did was, their suggestion was, and they issued a fatwa, and I wrote the fatwa. And they said, look, we want to protect society from getting more access to drugs as well. But we want to understand that there are health benefits for uh, something that cannot intoxicate you and get you high. It's, it's not psychoactive. So the fatwa was given, even though the classical scholars were actually a little bit more lenient than the modern day scholars today. But what they actually gave was, they gave, we gave a fatwa that says, anything which has primarily CBD and a very minimal amount of THC, like for example, hemp. Hemp is classified as being less than 0.3% THC, which means it's, the, the concentration cannot be psychoactive. You cannot, it's not really a drug. You're not getting high off of it. It's not, it's not, you can't even, that can't even happen. So we give a fatwa and said, the people who need this for some medical benefit, it will be allowed to use that because the argument is the same as, you know, there's wine, which is forbidden in Islam, but grape juice, can intoxicate you, so it's not forbidden in Islam. Uh, this beer is forbidden in Islam, but non-alcoholic beer cannot intoxicate you, no matter how much you take. So it's generally not forbidden in Islam. Uh, but there's not really that many medical benefits to that. But here, we're not only talking about, you know, it's nice to have or it tastes good. We're talking about something which really significantly affects the lives of people. So my uh, suggestion, my humble suggestion is, 
that uh, a great country like Malaysia and the scholars of Malaysia and the, maybe the government of Malaysia, they should look into the idea of producing their own fatwa and producing their own research in line with what scholars of the Shafi'i school of fiqh have said throughout and something which can apply and really pave the way for the Muslim community to find this really good balance between making sure to remove drugs from our society and not gain access to that, but also getting the type of medicine that people actually need is gonna improve their lives and it's gonna help their lives. So thank you very much again for inviting me to speak and for listening. And uh, if I can be of any service, Please let me know. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and bless your country. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Yang amat berbahagia Tun Muhammad Rao Sharif, YB Tan Sri Azhar Azizan Harun, Yang berbahagia Tan Sri Sharizat Abdul Jalil, YB Ahli Ahli Yang Berhormat Dewan Rakyat dan Dewan Negara, Pihak Pertadbiran Parlimen Malaysia, Pertubuhan Alumni Rumpun Fakulti Undang-Undang Universiti Malaya dan sidang hadirin yang dihormati sekalian. Alhamdulillah syukur kehadrat Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala dengan limpah kurnia dan izinnya kita dapat bersama-sama pada hari ini bagi membincangkan kepentingan dan kelebihan kanabis perubatan. Saya mengambil kesempatan ini untuk merakamkan ucapan terima kasih kepada Parlimen Malaysia dan Perfume atas kesudian menjemput saya. Nama saya Tengku Shnala Jamida. Saya seorang aktivis global dan juga penasihat kepada Regenabis iaitu satu inisiatif berasaskan keahlian, penganjuran acara dan khidmat nasihat yang memenuhi keperluan industri cannabis dan hemp sedunia yang sejajar dengan matlamat pembangunan mampan pertubuhan bangsa-bangsa bersatu di UN Sustainable Development Goals. Saya juga merupakan pengasas halal hemp yang merupakan Pasaran pengguna terus pertama untuk cannabidiol atau CBD yang melayani permintaan pengguna Islam. Kami mendapati bahawa CBD dan cannabis perubatan adalah halal apabila digunakan dalam keadaan tertentu di mana tiada alternatif yang lebih baik. Pengistiharaan ini dibuat oleh Majlis Fik Amerika Utara, the North American Fik Council. Manakala program eksklusif kami bersama The American Halal Foundation membolehkan kami mengesahkan mana-mana produk CBD yang tidak psikoaktif. Dalam kajian yang dijalankan oleh Kementerian Kesihatan, didapati bahawa satu daripada tiga rakyat Malaysia mengalami masalah kesihatan mental. Tahun lepas, terdapat hampir 50,000 kes baru kanser direkodkan. Faktor gaya hidup termasuk diet merokok dan penggunaan alkohol menyumbang kepada peningkatan bilangan pas- pesakit kanser. Ini tidak termasuk kanak-kanak dan de- orang dewasa epilepsi serta populasi warga emas yang semakin meningkat yang menghidap Alzheimer dan banyak lagi. Tubuh manusia ternyata mempunyai sistem endokannabinoid yang dianggap sebagai pengawal selia itu utama. Manakala kannabinoid yang terdapat dalam tumbuhan cannabis dapat membuka kunci reseptor di otak yang akan merangsang badan kita untuk menjalani gerak balas homeostasis yang justru dapat membantu seorang individu untuk mengurus imuniti, diet, tidur, sakit dan tekanan dengan lebih baik. Negara-negara Islam seperti Morocco, Lebanon dan UAE tidak lagi menganggap pemilikan produk hemp atau cannabis sebagai haram dari segi undang-undang. Ini merupakan perubahan dasar yang ketara di rantau ini dan di seantara dunia Islam. Dikriminalisasi hemp dan cannabis juga akan membuka laluan alternatif yang dianggap lebih berbelas kasihan untuk membantu merawat dan menguruskan gejala yang berkaitan dengan kanser, epilepsi dan pelbagai penyakit lain. Oleh itu, sekurang-kurangnya CBD harus didekriminalisasikan dan dibenarkan untuk diimport dalam kadar segera. Pada masa ini, piawaian umum bagi dekriminalisasi cannabis dan hemp adalah untuk produk yang mengandungi kurang daripada 0.3% THC. Tetapi penyelidikan dan kajian telah membuktikan bahawa THC dan pelbagai terpins dan cannabinoid lain seperti CBG dan CBN juga mempunyai kelebihan perubatan yang ketara yang juga dikenali sebagai kesan rombongan atau the entourage effect. 
Pada pada tahun 2020, Suruhanjaya PBB untuk Dadah Narkotik yang merupakan badan pembuat dasar PBB berkaitan dadah telah mengklasifikasikan semula cannabis dan resin cannabis di bawah penyenaraian antarabangsa yang mengiktiraf nilai perubatannya. Ini membawa saya kepada permulaan perang terhadap dadah. Saya ingin membaca kenyataan John Ehrlichman yang merupakan seorang penasihat dasar domestik kepada Presiden Richard Nixon iaitu Presiden American Syarikat yang ke-37 dalam bahasa Inggeris dengan izin. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. He said, you understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or blacks. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Sebenarnya, perang terhadap dadah dibina berdasarkan perkauman berstruktur. Isu di sini bukan mengenai data dan fakta saintifik di mana terdapat ribuan yang boleh ditemui dalam talian mengenai cannabis. Soalan saya, adakah kita harus terus mengekalkan kempen yang didorong oleh perkauman dan ketinggalan zaman yang ditanggung dari era yang telah lama berlalu? Adakah kita bertindak sebagai sebuah negara merdeka yang memintang, mementingkan kesihatan rakyat kita? Mari kita bertanggungjawab dalam dalam mendidik diri kita dan rakyat kita untuk memastikan kepentingan rakyat terjaga dan menyediakan akses kepada penjagaan kesihatan. Kita harus belajar untuk menormalkan perbualan dan dialog serta untuk menghindari daripada mengutuk atau menyerang mereka yang mencari ilmu untuk menangani stigma dengan berkesan. Walhal nenek moyang kita telah lama menggunakan kanabis sebagai ubat sebelum perang terhadap dadah bermula dan sebelum perubahan dasar dibuat. Budaya sebenar dan sejarah kita telah dicatat dalam Farmakopia Malaysia dan Kitab Tib. Jika anda melihat kembali rujukan ini, anda boleh melihat penggunaan kanabis perubatan serta rujukan kepada Indian Hemp. Anda semua yang berada di sini hari ini mempunyai kuasa itu. Anda boleh membuat keputusan dan membayangkan semula kemungkinan dan masa depan negara. Setelah mengetahui pelbagai perbualan mengenai cannabis di sini, ingin saya kongsi bahawa di Amerika Syarikat, sentimen umum masa kini ialah cannabis boleh digunakan sebagai kuasa global untuk kebaikan. Sudah tiba masanya untuk Malaysia juga. Akhir kata, saya menyokong penuh usaha Kementerian Kesihatan Malaysia yang bakal mengumumkan rangka kerja berhubung pendaftaran produk cannabidiol CBD. Kita harus terus memberikan fokus dalam penggunaan cannabis bagi tujuan penyelidikan dan pembangunan serta perubatan sekaligus menjadi negara terawal serta pemain utama di rantau ini yang berbuat demikian supaya tidak ketinggalan di ASEAN. Saya sudahi ucapan saya dengan wabilahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sekian, terima kasih. All right, those were the three speakers that we got from overseas. And uh, they happen to be all in California at this moment, which is about 15 hours behind us. So their time right now is about midnight. And hopefully, by the time we finish this program at 4 o'clock or so uh, this afternoon, they will be able, about 1 a.m., to join us in a question and answer session. Uh, with that, uh, let us now concentrate on our speakers here on this stage. I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Noor Azalia Kamurzaman first. But before that, let me read her biodata. Uh, in Malay. Dr. Nur Azalia Kamaruzaman ialah pensyarah kanan yang kini merupakan pengarah Pusat Racun Negara University Science Malaysia, USM. Beliau berkelulusan ijazah sarjana muda dalam bioteknologi, reka bentuk dan pembangunan dadah. Dengan kepujian kelas pertama dari University of Queensland, Australia, beliau kemudiannya memperolehi PhD dalam kajian anti-cancer dan genotoxicity 
dari USM. Minat semasa beliau termasuk mencari sebatian utama untuk anti kanser dan penyakit lain serta menilai pelbagai aspek toksikologi, sebatian dan bahan. Dengan itu dengan tidak melengahkan masa oleh sebab kita hanya ada lebih kurang sejam lebih sedikit lebih daripada sejam saya jemput Dr Nur Azalia. Thank you, uh, Tan Sri. Assalamualaikum dan selamat petang. Uh, saya Azalia dari Pusat Racun Negara. Okay, um, basically I'm just going to kind of recap a little bit on what the panelists have said. Yeah. Um, my role today is just to pretty much educate you about the misunderstanding or rather the stigma when you talk about cannabis, right? So, cannabis, the first thing most Malaysians think about is ganja, kan? Eh? Ganja weed, marijuana, high, euphoria. No, that's not entirely wrong, actually. So, um, so cannabis actually is a big, it's a genus. It's like the atas. It starts from the, from the top, but it's actually divided into two, hemp and marijuana. Okay? So you have like a genus, and it's divided into two types of species, which are hemp and marijuana. Now, hemp, um, as mentioned by the panelists, we were talking about CBD and THC. Now, THC is tetrahydrocannabinol. It is one of the hundreds of cannabinoids exist in a cannabis plant, which is responsible for the psychoactive properties. Correct, right? It also has a lot of therapeutic effects as well. But yes, psychoactive effect is one of its, um, let's just say, disadvantage. Okay? So that's THC. Now, CBD is another cannabinoid that is also becoming some sort of main interest in a research industry these days. Now, cannabidiol CBD is not psychoactive, all right? It is not psychoactive whatsoever, and it actually has a lot of therapeutic benefits, as highlighted by our panelists. You have epilepsy, cancer, um, anti-inflammation, pain, ADHD, um, depression, uh, and all of that. It, it, it basically, the list of medical benefits of CBD are keep stacking up because people all over the world are currently doing research. Clinical trials, animal trials, in vitro experiments, we're all discovering new potential for CBD. Now going back to the plants, yeah? Okay, fine. Marijuana has a lot of THC, 10 to 20%. And they have lower amount of CBD, which is about 10%. Now that is marijuana. Sure, you take marijuana, you get high, that makes sense. Now, hemp is another thing that I would like to highlight to all of you before you put like a, um, a, a negative connotation on hemp. Now, hemp has only less than 0.3% or 0.2% of THC. And it can go, it can has, it has about 10 to 20% of CBD. So, if you talk about hemp, you can smoke it all you want, you don't get high, right? So that's basically that's the gist of it. Now, under Akta Dadah Merbahaya 1952, Dangerous Drug Act in Malaysia, there is a blanket ban on cannabis, meaning that you can talk about hemp, you can talk about marijuana, they're all banned. No research, nothing whatsoever. So um, that is um, the purpose, I think, it is basically what we are here today, is to um, justify the injustice that hemp is being applied to. Right? And, um, and as mentioned by um, the panelists as well, the EU court in November 2020 has actually decreed that CBD is not a narcotic. And banning CBD is actually contrary to the society's uh, stance in caring for the welfare of the people. Okay? And the UN has actually agreed on WHO's um, recommendation in December 2020 in the same year to remove cannabis from Schedule 4. Which this means that when you're removing uh, cannabis from Schedule 4, this means that they are acknowledging that cannabis has medical properties. Yes, it is, it is still in Schedule 1, whereby it is highly liable for abuse, sure, but it propels a new pathway for medical research in a way that it is no longer the most dangerous substance in the world in the same par as heroin. Okay? So, okay, so that's just my brief introduction. Back to you, Tansri. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, we have an interesting introduction uh, on the issue of um, marijuana for medical use. Uh, is Malaysia ready to accept? Now, we have a range of panelists 
uh, they are not necessarily uh, opposing to each other's views, but from different perspectives. The second speaker that I want to invite uh, comes from uh, uh, this background, where he said, "My main, my main, uh, uh, my main reason to come and talk about marijuana medical use or, or, or whatever is the issue of penagihan." So with that, I want to invite uh, Inche Sutekno Ahmad Belon, and I want to read his biodata a little bit. Um, Encik Sutekno merupakan ketua pengarah agensi anti dadah kebangsaan, which is AADK. Sejak Januari 2021, beliau mempunyai latar belakang pendidikan di Wharton School University of Pennsylvania, Amerika Syarikat. Ya. Mula berkhidmat dalam sektor perkhidmatan awam pada 2003 dan mempunyai pengalaman di beberapa kementerian dan agensi kerajaan. Uh, dengan itu, tanpa lengah, saya jemput uh, Encik Sutekno untuk memberi pendapat. Terima kasih, Tan Sri. Um, yang bagi uh, Tan Sri, Tan Sri, uh, Datuk-Datuk, Tuan-Tuan dan Puan, terima kasih kerana memberi uh, peluang kepada ADK untuk uh, bersama-sama uh, dalam apa, uh, simposium ini. Dan kita sangat menyambut baik discussion yang terbuka Uh, yang mana akan memberi kebaikan kepada semua Saya percaya apa yang kita bincangkan ni sebenarnya adalah untuk mencapai satu matlamat Supaya Malaysia ini akan menjadi satu negara yang selamat, aman dan juga apa uh, apa uh, uh, senang diduduki, ya, didiami uh, Itu apa yang kita inginkan, uh, saya percaya semua orang itu jadi kalau uh, membincangkan dengan apa mengenai marijuana, marijuana ataupun apa di Malaysia ni uh, kalau soalan ni di, di, ditukar, uh, marijuana adakah Malaysia bersedia? Tapi kalau ditukar kepada ganja, adakah Malaysia bersedia? Saya rasa jawapan dia akan berbeza lah. Uh, rata-rata apa orang akan reject lah. Cuma kalau dilihat dari segi uh, apa uh, perbincangan yang lebih ke atas. Uh, sebagai uh, psychoactive plant yang apa dalam apa kumpulan cannabis ni cannabis ni ada banyak variety dan apa Dr Azli tadi pun telah jelaskan uh, yang mana kalau bagi kita di ADK uh, apa-apa saja policy setting yang akan disediakan untuk apa mencorak uh, tabiat uh, kehidupan kita perlu uh, untuk kita di ADK ni perlu uh, apa ni menghindari dari segi ketagihan. Penagihan ini adalah satu benda yang sukar untuk dipulihkan dan dia costly dan dia bukan sahaja untuk orang yang menagih itu saja yang menjadi masalah dia tapi dia ada satu lagi masalah called dependency iaitu keluarga dia pun bercelaru. Maknanya kalau ada seorang penagih di rumah satu keluarga tu akan menjadi haru biru lah. Uh, dan kalau soalan ini ditanya untuk uh, pegawai saya di ADK uh, Memang uh, dia akan kata pesan kepada semua orang uh, Bahawa uh, ni, uh, menagih marijuana ni uh, susah untuk dipulihkan lah. uh, Dan dia banyak kerosakan sebab mereka hari-hari jumpa uh, benda Cuma saya, apa yang kita nak, nak, nak nyatakan di sini sebagai permulaan um, apa sahaja uh, plant based uh, herb based yang ada unsur medicinal benefit ni perlu dikawal selia uh, ada apa ada kawalan dia dari segi uh, penggunaan dan telah diluluskan dengan tu supaya akhirnya nanti penggunaannya selamat dan tidak menyebabkan penagihan dan uh, dan apa uh, apa-apa sahaja argument yang ada Uh, perlu juga dibuktikan secara klinikal lah, maknanya kita ada platform, kita ada apa prosedur yang jelas perlu merujuk, dia tak boleh self claim lah. Uh, kalau kita lihat sejarah macam tadi sejarah uh, apa, uh, apa ni cannabis ni memang apa sejak 1500 uh, tahun sebelum masihi juga apa apa uh, apa ni uh, tumbuhan ini telah memberi manfaat kepada Uh, apa ni kepada kehidupan kepada manusia 
Begitu juga opium sebenarnya sebagai ubat pelali dan sebagainya. Cuma apabila apa, uh, apa teknologi extraction uh, compound tu begit, uh, become advance ada concentration maka uh, apa dan dia abandon uh, di market uh, dia apa menjurus ke salah guna penyalahgunaan itulah yang kita risau lah uh, sebenarnya uh, uh, maknanya uh, kalau dia tidak disalah guna dan tidak menyebabkan penagihan bagi kita di di ADK pada amnya kita tidak pernah membantah lah. Ha, apa kita pernah membantah, maka boleh dipesu lah benda tu. Itu dia punya stand lah. Ramai orang bertanya pada saya, kenapa adakah uh, apa ni ADK menentang kalau cannabis ni uh, boleh dibuat untuk apa perubatan? Bagi kita, kita ada prosedur, kita ada kerangka kerja uh, yang boleh di, uh, ikuti, maka ikutilah kerangka tu. Dia tak boleh self claim lah. Tiba-tiba kita kata bahawa yang ini baik, dia jadi addicted. So, addicted apabila dia telah mencapai tahap yang lebih parah, sukar untuk di, diubati. Dan persoalan adakah kita bersedia kalau dia apa untuk apa perubatan ini, sebenarnya perlu dijawab oleh people on the floor ni lah. Adakah kita bersedia? Adakah kita bersedia? Sejarah telah membuktikan, contohnya semasa Perang Dunia Kedua, heroin dan morfin digunakan sebagai terpetik dan juga untuk menahan sakit dan sebagainya. Dan kebanyakannya dibawa masa di ASEAN ini, masa Perang apa Vietnam. Tetapi apabila apa perang telah tamat. Uh, apa uh, tidak ada lagi keperluan untuk uh, tujuan uh, perubatan uh, uh, apa ni supply itu abandon supply itu abandon dan akhirnya pihak membekal telah apa memasarkannya di pasaran terbuka dan dia menyebabkan satu penyalahgunaan dan kita bimbang apa uh, benda yang sama pun akan berlaku kepada Uh, apa sahaja uh, apa benda-benda uh, yang psikoaktif ini uh, yang memberi kesan ketagihan ini kalau dia abandon uh, dia akan disalahguna itu uh, sebagai permulaan Tan Sri. Uh, terima kasih Cik Tekno. Um, <coughs> uh, I have told our next speaker iaitu uh, yang berhormat Dr Kelvin Yi that he is going to take last because because he belongs to parliament he is the you know this is his house so he should be speaking last so with that let me introduce uh, dr kelvin yi uh, latar belakangnya uh, nama penuh ya dr kelvin yi li yuan telah berkhidmat sebagai ahli parlimen bandar kuching sejak mei 2018 kini beliau memegang jawatan sebagai ketua angkatan muda harapan dan dilantik sebagai pengurusi jawatan kuasa pilihan khas kesihatan, sains dan inovasi sejak Januari 2021. Selain itu, beliau merupakan ketua kebangsaan sosialis muda DAP sejak Mac 2022. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Kelvin, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much uh, Tan Sri. Uh, selamat petang, salam sejahtera semua. Uh, terima kasih kerana uh, memberikan satu platform kepada saya untuk berkongsi pendapat saya tentang satu isu yang sangat penting yang kerap dibincangkan kalau kita bertanya di luar, terutamanya di kalangan anak muda. Uh, selain apa yang dikatakan oleh Tan Sri tadi, saya juga sebahagian daripada caucus Dwi Partisan di Parlimen yang kami uh, mengkaji atau uh, membuat nasihat tentang policy framework yang untuk kerajaan Uh, terutamanya dalam isu bukan saja tentang uh, medical marijuana tetapi industrial hemp dan juga ketum di Malaysia. Kita tahu ini satu isu yang sangat uh, popular, satu isu sangat besar terutamanya di negeri-negeri di utara Malaysia. Um, jadi dalam caucus kami, kita membincangkan pelbagai aspek ataupun sudut polisi tersebut. We know that if we look at this policy, it is not just a policy of health or medical policy. There is multiple aspects and fears to it, spheres to it. On health, I think the previous panelists and of course the distinguished uh, academician here has uh, shared with you the importance as well as the benefits it has on different 
uh, issues, for example, treatment of epilepsy, uh, treatment of anxiety, whether it comes to mental health, treatments of chronic pain, and so on and so forth. Of course, the CBD uh, has, has those medical properties as well. Uh, but of course, with that said, uh, I would like to give some level of caution because, uh, for example, the International Association of Studies of Pain, IASP, has mentioned uh, that if we want to look at fully substantive and comprehensive uh, uh, research to prove the medical properties of, of uh, cannabis, uh, there is actually not much. And the caveat to that is, it is because not much research can be done due to the criminality of the, the drug itself. So for example, uh, I'm sure she can testify, for example, if an academician or a, 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 a research facility in Malaysia wants to apply for research, yes, there is avenues, but there is so much bureaucracy, there's so much obstacles, there's so much hurdles because it's been classified under uh, DTA and, and so on and so forth. But with that said, uh, the caucus that I'm part of, we want to look at different aspects of, of, of the whole uh, uh, policy, which of course includes regulatory framework, uh, public awareness, and also uh, enforcement framework. Sebab kita kena, I, I, I setuju dengan uh, colleague saya, sebenarnya kami dua-dua orang Sarawak, that in the context of Malaysia, uh, enforcement is a big issue. And something that is meant to be good, uh, sometimes can be abused for unintended consequences. Uh, tapi saya sedikit tak bersetuju dengan hujahan yang dikatakan bahawa dulunya kita ada heroin, kita ada morfin yang digunakan untuk tujuan perbuatan dan sekarang kita lihat kesannya. Sebab kita bagi saya, kita kena bezakan heroin dan morfin tu dengan uh, hemp atau CBD kerana heroin tersebut mereka ada psychoactive properties. But when it comes to CBD, we have known that the level of, uh, uh, there's no psychoactive uh, property. So to that extent, there is some level of uh, difference, differentiation. So um, what we are looking at, especially in the level of the caucus, is, is to, to look at how can this, how can the government of Malaysia, regardless of who is in power, have a good framework so that we can harness not just the medical properties, but also the economic properties of this industry. We know that Thailand, our northern neighbors, right now they are the pioneer in, in the region in trying to uh, 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 harness what they claim as a possible four billion US dollar industry when it comes to medical marijuana. Actually, the whole industry of not, it's not just medical marijuana, it's the hemp industry. As mentioned by the panelists, hemp can be made into many other things, whether it's a skin for, for buildings, Kevlar vests, clothes, and so on and so forth. The whole industry is estimated to be 60 billion ringgit. And this, this on the issue of economy, it's not just taxes generated for the government that could be used for, for other purposes, but it could be seen as a, a sphere of poverty elevation towards those people, especially in the rural areas. Sebab kita bagi satu tanaman alternatif kepada mereka. Of course, I'm not saying that kita semua, ta, semua petani berhenti dari menanam padi dan semua tan tanam hemp. Tetapi apa yang kita perlu adalah menyediakan satu framework kepada mereka supaya mereka juga dapat menjamna pendapatan secara halal, menjamna pendapatan secara um, in, uh, proportionate uh, 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 how say, income so that they can alleviate them from their poverty. Because I give you an example, and this is after talking to many stakeholders in our caucus, do you know, macam ketum. Ketum, dia is very prevalent dekat uh, negeri-negeri di utara. Malah sebenarnya saya pernah pergi ke satu negeri Kedah, ke Kedah, dan satu jamuan, mereka telah sediakan minuman macam putih-putih sikit lah. Saya tanya apa tu? Uh, ketum. <laughs> Jadi saya, saya tak berani cuba lah. Tapi it's, it's, so, it's so prevalent, it's so common. Pet, saya diberitahu petani-petani, nelayan-nelayan sebelum mereka keluar pekerja sebab mereka nak umkan kena ada energy drink, mereka akan minum satu gelas sebelum pergi. So, how do we regulate that? And how do we harness the economic properties? Because kita diberitahu, banyak the the ketum that is grown in Malaysia is actually yang paling berkualiti di dunia. Tetapi sebab dia haram di Malaysia, apa yang berlaku, mereka seludup semua daun ketum tu pergi Thailand. Thailand mereka akan proses, mereka akan bottle it dalam satu pil supplementary dipanggil Malay Malaya keratum akan dijual ke US. Di US there is a, a, a there is is registered under FDA as a step down therapy towards opioid addiction. So again, huge 
economic properties. Malah saya diberitahu mereka yang seludup uh, ketum ni ke, ke, negeri, ke negara Thailand sebulan mereka dapat pendapatan sekurang-kurangnya 15 hingga 20 ribu sebulan. Kalau kita kawal selia, if we regulate this industry, imagine the elevation of poverty we can help with the people, especially in the rural areas, in the heartlands of, of Malaysia. Again, I said this with caution and caveat. It has to be done and regulated properly. Of course, when it comes to medical marijuana, I think on a health side, uh, we want to, we, we, we also we recognize the benefits. But of course, how do we then control it? Why am I for, to a certain extent, especially for medical marijuana? It's because we need to control the black market. Okay? In a black market, if we do not provide safer alternatives for where parents, for where patients that require such therapy to buy it, where kita boleh kawal quality produk tersebut, mereka akan pergi ke black market untuk beli satu produk yang mungkin kita tahu apa mereka campur dalam. It can be even worse than, than, than the, the real stuff itself and even more dangering to their, to their health. So there has to be a clear policy to regulate it. When it comes to industrial hemp, and this is for me in Malaysia the lowest lying fruit. Okay, medical marijuana may be a, a, a difficult position, maybe one step further. But industrial hemp for me is an industry that we should right now have a proper policy framework to do it. The fact of the matter, there was a cabinet decision in 2019 that actually gazetted a piece of land in Kedah to plant industrial hemp. Uh, the special announcement or the press conference they were scheduled to do it was actually two days lepas Sheraton move. And we know what happened after that. And that is why that, that, that whole issue was put in a back burner. But uh, I think in a few months ago, uh, our caucus actually met with the, the current Prime Minister, uh, Yang Ahmad Bohamad uh, Ismail Sabri, to explain to him uh, how the country can harness the potential of this industry, industrial hemp, not just on, on how, not just revenues for the country, but as, as I mentioned just now, poly, poverty alleviation. And then he was very positive. He says that we will look at the cabinet, we'll bring it to discuss in the cabinet. And I think after that, he made an announcement a few weeks after that they were looking into it. So again, I see this as a good move uh, towards tapping into this industry. So with that said, and I want to summarize with this. Uh, there has to be, as, as we look at the good things of, of and, and many of the panelists have mentioned on the good things of, of harnessing this industry. But the caveat is we always have to take it in the context of Malaysia. I'm a bit more cautious. Uh, there has to be few frameworks to be preparing. Uh, number one, as I said, for this policy to come in place, three, three main frameworks. Number one, we have to educate the healthcare workers itself on the use of medical marijuana, contohnya and when to prescribe, what to prescribe for. Because right now, technically, technically, uh, a GP or any medical professional, they can actually prescribe because it's registered in FDA. They can apply to, to prescribe it. But let me tell you the cost of it. It's 30,000 US dollars. Siapa nak prescribe? Siapa nak beli? Siapa mampu beli? So at the end of the day, if we somehow legalize, we open the market and everything, and we reduce the price, and we give safer alternatives, maybe this is an achievable thing. So I said, we have to educate the healthcare workers because kalau kita tak educate, siapa berani? I don't dare to prescribe pun. Okay? Number two, we need extra uh, uh, public awareness on the, prob on, on the issue. And I fully agree with my colleague. Kalau kita cakap ganja, there is a stigma to it. But how do we educate people on the benefits and educate people on how not to abuse the product itself? And number three is the framework. The regulative framework macam mana kita nak kawal selia. That's the most important and of course enforcement. Kalau saya contohnya, kalau kita nak tanam hemp, mungkin bukan semua boleh tanam semua. We have to come up a framework where we can get, where to get the seeds, quality seeds for single petani, and maybe they can plant only a certain acres. And how do you regulate constant enforcement, constant testing of, of the quality of the product so that it has not unintended or added, added uh, additional issues. And, and also laws that has to be changed. The DDA in 1952 has to be changed. There has to remove obstacles for research to be done to find more benefits for it. As I'm a trained medical doctor and we are trained to be evidence-based. So the best way to be evidence-based is to allow a, a, a conducive environment for research to be robust on these issues and we make decisions based on those uh, researches that is, and science and that is available. And as I said, we, I at the beginning quoted Thailand. Thailand, yes, they took a very proactive step. Uh, 
in fact, matter, our health minister is currently there discussing with their health minister to look at what they are doing. Uh, oh, this is to stop me from talking. <laughs> Sorry, if you give mic to the politician, they don't have to talk. But this is something I'm very passionate about. So, so again, in Thailand, we can learn the good and the bad. We can learn how they do it. The bad thing is, let me tell you now, that it is because their policy has been, in my view, been, been rushed. There is so much loopholes and it's in a mess now in Thailand. So if we are in Malaysia, we want to be able to practice, we want to implement it in the context of us. There are many issues that we can learn from Thailand, their mistakes and their best practices. We take it step by step. And I said the first step is remove hurdles for research, remove bureaucracy for research, get data, get research. Strengthen our agriculture framework. One of the good, one of the reason why Thailand can do it well is because Thailand has a good agriculture framework. So that is where we need to strengthen. As I said, small steps, then slowly we move towards medical marina, so on and so forth. So back to the final question. Right? The, the first question we ask is Malaysia ready? Let me tell you, ten years ago, that's now I was with Tan Sri Sharizat. She mentioned she dia pun tak sangka ada topik macam ini akan keluar di parlimen. Ten years ago, we were not ready. Today. We are more ready. Are we 100% ready? No, but we are more ready. We need to get the framework. We need to get the conversation ready. The fact of the matter, right before I moved here, I spoke to a researcher from the center. He mentioned that they did a research in, in April, uh, gauging public uh, support for the use of drugs in, in different issues. And when it comes to cannabis, especially when it comes to treatment of physical pain, more than 50% of Malaysians are supportive and positive of it. And that actually speaks uh, where we are today where we are today. So with that, thank you, Tansri. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Kelvin. I think when his speaker went dead, he thought he was in parliament where the speaker can switch it off. <laughs> now, um, I, I, I want to announce that there are uh, persons in the, uh, amongst you, the audience. Uh, one of them is uh, Professor uh, Samsha is here. Um, is it Samsha? Who is here in, uh, in, in the, uh, among us, who is also an expert in the area of uh, cannabis. Uh, we also have the assistance uh, to uh, Encik Sutekno from the, his own ministry. Uh, uh, one of them is a doctor uh, involved very much in the field of penagihan uh, and drugs. Uh, we, we welcome you. Perhaps you can participate by way of either explanation or by way of question, uh, so that this, this particular uh, session can be a lot more beneficial. Now, uh, interestingly, um, uh, Dr. Calvin said that whether 10 years ago we were ready, but actually I became interested and I volunteered to be, uh, to, to want to hold this session because of the nature of my work. In 1990, there was a person called uh, Kerry Wiley, uh, who was the first American. The Malaysian prosecutors were so keen to hang because he was arrested in his uh, girlfriend's house, a Malay girl, with some amount of uh, cannabis. Uh, but somehow or other, the case uh, landed in my hand, and I. When I examined the case, this boy was, was the darling of IBM, a genius as an engineer in, in the US. And I asked him, interviewed him for a long time. Uh, then finally I got to know that he was dependent on cannabis, not because he, he has nagihan, but rather he was using it for medicinal benefits. This boy at the age of 16, was climbing up the Sacramento Hills in California, uh, 16 years old, on the eve of Christmas. He fell 300 meters, broke every major bone, but miraculously survived overnight the winter, the bitter winter uh, in, in the hills. He was discovered on the 26th Boxing Day, described by the uh, journals as a Christmas miracle. But when they patch him up, he became okay, he survived. Every time he sleeps, he will curl up into a fetal position. 
because of the pain. And then to uncoil himself in the morning was hell. Until he discovered that smoking a joint of marijuana, it was so easy for him to get up and move normally. So he was dependent uh, on marijuana or cannabis as you can call it uh, for medicinal purposes. And that was the reason why he kept on posting to himself wherever he went. So he posted from Bangkok to his girlfriend's house and he was arrested for it. So I raised the defense of necessity because he can only come under that. Uh, necessity because he, it, it was for medical benefit and without it, he just cannot survive. The pain was too unbearable. Because we did not develop the law yet at that time, uh, there was some difficulty. But the judge who was Justice Sheikh Daud was very sympathetic. In fact, he virtually cried in court because he had to sentence the man not for drug trafficking, because certainly it's not drug trafficking. He was using it for himself. But he ended up initially for five years. But the judge wasn't happy with it. I call a person to give evidence in court from Harvard. He was Professor Lester Greenspoon, who is the, the father of all pirating. He was a person who started off being totally anti all drugs, including marijuana, until his nine year old boy had uh, uh, blood cancer and had to, re to receive chemotherapy almost every 10 days or every week. And he would run from his psychiatric department to the cancer ward so that he can be with the boy and the wife. And he dreads every single treatment because the boy will vomit in the car in the pail until there's nothing else to vomit. His oesophagus will break and he will vomit blood. And this goes on sometime for 48 hours. Rush, he went into the cancer ward, expecting the worst. He found mother and son were giggling, having a, sharing a joke and giggling away. So he thought it was a private joke. He, he did not think of it. Chemotherapy was executed. Not only the boy did not vomit throughout the journey in the car, but the boy told the dad, Dad, can you stop? and buy me a submarine sandwich, which is this big. And he downed the sandwich. He did not vomit. He ate a lot. So the father then asked the mother, what, what is going on? So the, the, the mother said, I read about cannabis. We two shared one joint about half an hour before the chemo session. From that day onward, Professor Lester Greenspoon, from being a psychiatrist, changed himself to be the world expert on marijuana. So this is one of the fantastic stories I heard. And I had occasion to share a long time ago with our late young Teramat Mulia Tunku Abdul Rahman. So I told him, you know, Tunku, if, if you had legalized marijuana, you will never go blind because of glaucoma. You say, what do you mean? I say, yeah, the two of us can share one joint every day because his house was so close to my house. And he said, now, you should have told me a lot earlier, I would have recognized it. <laughs> so anyway, with that, can I open this session, either for clarification or addition or for question time? Can I please? Uh, can I add a little bit? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Tan Sri. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, one of the other considerations in our caucus is on the criminalization of possession. Of marijuana, and I think Tan Sri, as a, as a practicing criminal lawyer, will understand the implications of in Malaysia, especially due to DDA, that a lot of young people are in prison due to uh, possession. So, is the proportionality of the crime fair? And we know in Malaysia there is high level of uh, uh, prison congestion, and if 70% are, are due to possession and due to this possession of marijuana, should we do something about it? I think a lot of the laws in Malaysia, especially when it comes to drug, was framed with the mindset of this whole war against drugs. That means a very strong arm um, tactic against drugs. But the reality is it, it does not work. I think Thailand has recognized that and they are taking a different perspective to see how it works. So I think it is right for Malaysia to even consider that. Thank you. Uh, Professor Aisha, now I got your name right. Professor Aisha, would you like to say something?
Assalamu alaikum. Thank you uh, for the very interesting discussion. Um, take this up. Uh, I agree with the panelists uh, this afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate the fact that when, I mean, I've spent uh, 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 much of my academic life analyzing uh, urine samples for drugs of abuse. And what we are looking for is actually a, a metabolite of THC. And it's only THC that we are looking for and nothing else. Um, so so the, the only culprit in the cannabinoid extract is THC. If we can monitor that, if we can have a framework where we can ensure that all the products that are in the market has control levels of THC, then I think it is something that uh, it can be, uh, you know, it can be a scenario where uh, people can access these drugs. Now, the World Anti-Doping Agency uh, for sports testing, if you look at the prohibited list, they would actually list THC metabolite only. And they specifically said that cannabidiols, other cannabidiols are allowed in sports. And this brings the, you know, uh, illustrates the statement where cannabidiols are uh, uh, have a lot of potential and have a lot of uh, medical benefits. So that's what I wanted to share. And, and, and it is a very complex mixture. There's more than 100 cannabidiols in the, in the uh, buds of the, and the flowers of the cannabis plant. But uh, you know, to know them all is all still under research, but uh, there is a, long, uh, a lot of uh, thousands of publications now on most of these cannabidiols. Uh, and even from the viewpoint of uh, uh, CB receptors or cannabinoid receptors in the body, we know of uh, CB1 and CB2 receptors. There are now CB3 receptors in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the research uh, uh, findings that brings the uh, CB receptors to three now instead of two. So these are always changing. And I implore that you know, uh, education must start in the universities, in the, uh, in, in the respective government agencies. I think it is important to know the facts. Prof, wh yes. why don't you tell us, what is receptors you are talking about? <laughs> when you administer a drug, the drug acts on receptors in your body right. to make the effect, to give an effect, to remedy the uh, affliction that you are suffering from. So that's receptors. So we have receptors in the body called endocannabinoid receptors. Mm -hmm. And it is so-called endocannabinoid because the researchers used cannabis extracts to find these receptors. Right. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's the same as opioid receptors. Opium, they research on opium, and we now know there are several opioid receptors in our brain. And that's, these are responsible for pain. So receptors are those that will actually make an effect in the body, uh, I mean produce an effect that will remedy the situation that you're suffering from. That's what receptors are about. Yeah. So we have in our bo own bodies, cannabis itself named differently. They're called anandamide and 2-AG. These are, these are substances that we produce in our body. Yeah? And they are the cannabinoids, the endocannabinoids, as was stated by the panelists. Yeah. But, Anyway, on a personal note, last week I was diagnosed to have SLE, and you probably know SLE is systemic lupus erythematosus. And my research as a pharmacologist, I would not subject myself to any of the drugs that are used for SLE because of all the side effects that it brings. Uh, I, I used to have polymyalgia rheumatica, which is also an autoimmune dis disorder some five years ago, and I was you know, suffering from the pharmaceuticals that I had to take. So this time around, I am submitting an uh, import permit for CBD for my own condition. Yeah. That's how I feel about the, uh, after, after reading, after researching what afflictions, and there are 172 afflictions that, can, that uh, CBD has a benefit for. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, just, just to add on to that, uh, when you said THC is the culprit. Uh, I do not know. Uh, I, I should tell you because when, when Lester Greenspoon was talking, he said his uh, first son, 
not the nine-year-old uh, who succumbed to cancer, but his first son came second to win the Nobel Award. And he wrote a paper, or rather rewrote the entire theory of the Big Bang Theory, of the formation of the universe. He came second, so he didn't win the Nobel Peace Award. But when he called his father, and he told his father, you know, Dad, I, I wrote that paper overnight under the influence of marijuana. <laughs> okay. Apparently, it opens up your Abs mind to a different dimension. Absolutely. Also. <laughs> okay. Well, let me, let me uh, <laughs> clarify about THC. Now, there are many afflictions where THC is required. In epilepsy, for example, uh, there are epilep epilepsy uh, patients who, who has benefits from 3 to 1 CBD to THC. Yeah? Right. So some THC is needed in some of these afflictions. Yeah. And in most countries, these are uh, prescribed. Yeah? So, so these are prescribed by doctors where they can take THC in addition to the CBD that they are using. So, and, and there are people who, who find uh, you know, a remedy from 1 to 1, one part of the CBD to one part of THC. And that's the nature of the distribution of uh, the receptors in our bodies are different. Each of, each of us are different. Yes. That's what. That, I mean, yeah. that reminds me, Prof, I think that's a very interesting statement you made. The recent arrest, which I cannot talk too much, the recent arrest of a former ambassador and his son. The son was manufacturing a combination of a full spectrum to a combination of proportion. Purely for cancer patients, he, he sold it at cost. Sometimes he lost a lot of money. The father, of course, has got nothing to do with it, but, you know, as usual, police rope in everybody and charge everybody. Um, but that is the reality. You're, 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 you're right. Uh, you're not the first to say that. I, I've been hearing this from various other sources. Okay. So now back to the issue so that we are, we are reaching 4 o'clock. I hope you will tolerate we go a little bit uh, longer than this. But it is basically now to, uh, to agree whether hemp or marijuana or we call it cannabis, how do you regulate the plantation of this, the planting of this, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, plants? And how do you regulate this industry where research is needed. I'm told by Dr. Noor Azalia and also Professor Aisha uh, was telling me that for many years she has got labs in Penang, uh, highly paid for the labs, but she couldn't get the permit to do the full research on marijuana. As I understand, Dr. Noor Azalia is having a similar problem. Can, can you, Dr. Noor Azalia, can you please uh, state this, that the, the kind of difficulty the government is giving you that you cannot do research in this area. All right. Uh, thank you, Tansri. Uh, perhaps Prof. Aisha can uh, come up with your, own <laughs> with your own problems. I'll talk about mine. So, um, so we have been um, fighting for this project. We've been, uh, we've been trying, to, we've been writing a proposal. We've included all the best technologies in Malaysia. We're talking about, we, we understand the reservation when it comes to THC and marijuana. Sure, we're, we're bringing in botanists, tissue culturists, clones, you know, to ensure that uh, if we want to cultivate, then they come from purely bred hemp plants. We've included IoT, blockchain, biomarker to ensure that we can trace um, the plant from seed to market. We have given... Um, we feel that the most advanced proposal that we've, we've, we've could, we can possibly made, and we, we've, we started with the first government, it's been three governments since then, we've been rejected. And um, the, so, the reason that we were given was that according to Akta Dadah Merbahaya, uh, the Minister of Health can give permission for the research to be conducted to Pegawai Awam, okay, Pegawai Awam. Um, unfortunately, us in the academia, we are not considered that. We are penjawat awam. So there's a bit of techni technicality. At the same time, what is quite interesting is in 2019, there was a minute mesyuarat jemaah menteri, whereby it was stated that uh, UA, 
university awam, such as USM, can be involved in such research. So actually, kami mula pursue this pun based on the Jemaah Menteri punya um, stance lah, right? So we've been rejected basically um, since that. We started in 2018. So we do, um, as, as Prof Aisha mentioned, we do implore. Um, we are from the academia, we're interested in research. Research for the benefit of humankind. And we've heard stories from uh, Tan Sri. And actually, I've talked to a few doctors um, in Kelantan, actually, where they talk about parents who are so desperate because their children have epilepsy, the severe kinds of epilepsy, where they develop resistance to the treatment. And they have to get illegal CBD oil from Thailand to basically medicate their children. This is a desperate measure. Basically, these are parents who are willing to sacrifice their life or who are uh, putting themselves at risk lah. Kena tangkap under section 39B, for example, um, untuk anak-anak, right? Jadi, that is why, that is the reason that we want to pursue this. There is no uh, political bias, there is no, um, it's just for, solely for the sake of medication and the opportunity for Malaysians to have access to this drug. At the same time, we have a tropical climate and Hemp can grow very much easily. They require a lot of sun. So we have an advantage that a lot of countries don't. I think it's, it's uh, like a country, other countries, European countries, they have four seasons. They have to fight for sunlight. And we have plenty of those. And yet we are extra cautious about this for some reason. Yes. So that is the obstacle lah yang kami go through and we're not giving up actually. So I'm really grateful to be given the opportunity to be on this platform today to voice our plight, our, the academics. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you. So we, we seem to more or less agree that CBD is all right. TAC is the one that requires severe regulation and how do we go about it? Yeah, uh, Because you know, like, like uh, Dr. Kelvin said, uh, we've got the best ketum. I suspect we may have the best cannabis as well. But we have the best ketum, we don't export them. And we have the best durian, and we export them like hell. Yeah, you, can, you, can, you can see the difference. So ketum can be another serious source of income. Uh, not only as a matter of income, but a serious source of uh, medicine that one can resort to. And I, and I know a very close friend of mine, in fact, seven of them. They are all what, they, I, what I call a te tarik kaki. All the seven consume ketum. I know this for a fact. And they say their level of sugar, because they're all diabetic, has gone down tremendously. It is not imaginative. Yeah? It, is, it is something which, uh, which apparently has happened. But uh, it is something that needed some research. Um, can I ask uh, J. Sutekno, maybe you can suggest whether, so, sorry, yeah. C can you introduce your name? Yes. Definitely. Thank you. I think it's on. Yeah. Yes. Uh, good evening, Tansri. A very interesting topic. <laughs> I'm a medical doctor. My name is uh, Dr. Prepal, Amar Prepal bin Abdullah. I am the Deputy Speaker of the State Assembly, Penang. And uh, this topic is very interesting. I would like to say that I come from a medical college in India where cannabis was free flow. We talk about four, a packet four ringgit here. The price at present has gone up to 15 ringgit because of the ban. But in India, you have 20 kilos or 30 kilos on the table and the students will be enjoying it. This is a true story I'm talking. And uh, I'm anti-smoking and anti-drug as I come from the background of Punjabi family. So, when they come back to Malaysia, 95% of them give up. So, good news. That means you can give up ganja. But the 5% still continue. And I've seen them on some occasions where they still smoke. These uh, graduate doctors who have come back from my college. 
and uh, I've been part of the anti dada kebangsaan from 1996 until 2018. First, I was a doctor in Pusat Serenti, Bukit Mentajam. And later, I was a ahli lembaga pelawat Pusat Serenti until I became a pengurusi in 2018. And that is where I joined the politics and I couldn't hold the post anymore. Because even in drugs, they brought politics inside. I, I was a CNC doctor. Coming to the topic today. Doc, Adakah before before you go on, can you tell us what happened to the five percent doctors who still smoke? They are still uh, doing. Uh, it. Are, are they doing all right? They are still doing all right and doing good. No ah. problem. So, adakah Malaysia bersedia? What I want to say is, what I want to say is, the whole system in this country at present, if you look at what our pengarah of agency Dada Kebangsaan said. It keeps repeating, repeating, repeating. And uh, methadone, for example. It was started off for treating people with heroin and all that. But end of the day, the same patients will come back seven times, eight times to the Pusat. Until I think the Pusat people will say, hey, please, it's better you go off than you come back to the Pusat. The problem is monitoring. You leave it to the police system. Police is not going to do anything about it. I know there are doctors who prescribe methadone. They mix it along with cough syrup and they sell it for 45 ringgit. And it's money making business. But none of them from the agency Dada Kebangsaan or the PDRM dare to go to the doctor's clinic and tell the doctor, hey doctor, you're doing some nonsense in your clinic. Can you stop it? You just have to give a warning. I think these doctors will all Kuchut and they'll stop doing what they're doing. But none of them is bothered. One fine day they came to my clinic, three of them, after 20 years of my clinic practice, they came in and they said, Doctor, we want to see your methadone book, notebook, how you prescribe and who you prescribe. I just got up, I said, thanks for waking up after 20 years. This is the first time you are coming to my clinic and you can leave my clinic now. Get out. I was quite rude. I told them, go back and do your homework and come. If you can prove that I gave one guy methadone in my clinic, I'll give up my certificate. And what I want to say is the whole system, dispensing, who is going to do the dispensing? Who's going to prescribe? Who's going to do the dispensing? Are we going to allow all our pharmacies to do? You just walk into the pharmacies, you take cough sit up, cough with one. You want whatever you want, you can get from the pharmacies nowadays. Even they can check your blood pressure, they can check your diabetics and start treating you also. So who is going to control the whole system? At the end of the day, it will be anti Dada Kumangsan who face this problem day in and day out. We try to stop ganja, cannot. We try to stop heroin, cannot. But I pity the people who are medically who need this. So, in a way, it can be legalized in Malaysia, but should be strictly controlled. Sorry, strictly? Strictly controlled. Control. Yeah. The control is very important. That means the deserving patients should get this treatment. Right. Not everyone claiming that we want it, we want it. As you know, from Japanese World War, we are talking about opium. Tai Chandu, everyone was taking it. Yeah. Then came the law, stop them and all that. But till today, there are certain old people who still get this Tai Chandu to drink with the coffee in the morning. So no. what I say is, we are ready if we have all these things in order. If not, don't waste the time and don't waste the country's money on this thing. Especially what is happening with heroin and ganja. We have wasted millions of dollars, but still we cannot get rid because mostly our people are involved in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> by, by the way, I was educated by Lester Greenspoon that the name heroin was given because heroin was a hero of medicine in World War I. So from being a hero, it is now treated as a villain.
but it is all because of abuse and lack of control. So I, I don't think name matters, whether you're a hero or not. It's a question of how it is being used. I think with that, let me ask uh, uh, Che Sutekno. Uh, just hang on. Che, che, che Sutekno, can you, can, can you tell us what is the best way that we can regulate uh, this uh, usage for medicine and also uh, how do you regulate it uh, industry-wise? Um, um, in general, like this, uh, we, we should have a, 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 a policy framework that uh, will regulate use and prevent misuse and prevent uh, abuse. So um, I leave it to uh, the legislator to think about that. Uh, but our, our concern um, now, uh, as uh, our young Muhammad uh, Deputy Speaker says that everybody can dispense uh, everything uh, without uh, being uh, cautious or whatever. Uh, everybody can uh, just uh, claim that uh, this thing uh, got a medical, uh, 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 medicinal benefit, then uh, post it in a, in a uh, YouTube or TikTok and whatever, and 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 the follower just just uh, what? Uh, macam apa excited dan apa uh, beramai-ramai subscribe apa to to that kind of apa uh, ni so i hope apa ni yang yang kita sangat concern sekarang ni um, at the end of the day uh, apa uh, whatever it is yang kita claim sebagai apa boleh mem, apa ni memberi uh, kesan baik kepada uh, perubatan uh, dia tidak di uh, di salah guna uh, dan tidak mendatangkan mudarat uh, yang mana sekarang uh, apa uh, apa ni uh, user the the trend now uh, especially the apa ni uh, apa the youth um, they are on a poly poly drug user kan dia dia they try kata dia try uh, certain drug then apa then apa they embark on the thing termasuklah ketum yang kita concern tu lah walaupun dia they the best in in the country apa semua but uh, the tendency now uh, people tak follow the proper step uh, yang mana uh, yang mana yang tan sri bagi tahu the the seven apa uh, teh tarik tu tadi dia follow a proper traditional way of apa ni buat air ketum tu but yang lain-lain tu dia campur dengan ubat batuk lah campur dengan macam-macam yang become addicted dan right. become self destructive so, so. itu itu dia punya itulah isu yeah. kan? uh, uh, dr kevin can you can you perhaps apart from un, uh, commenting uh, generally uh, can you tell us whether parliament is uh, is having any committee that looks into this area to legalize um, thank you so much for the question i think the caucus of the bipartisan caucus on this issue is the one that is most active pursuing this uh, um, issue, especially on a policy and regulatory framework. So I think uh, to answer the question, how do, you th how do we think is the best way to regulate? Uh, there are a few steps that we can take. I think number one, we have to decriminalize it. Uh, take it out. I'm not saying that we allow recreational use, but I think we must take the criminalization out of it. That's number one. Number two is allow uh, uh, more research remove the bureaucracy into it so that we make decisions based on, on evidence and also data and science. And number three, I think there has to be a, a center, uh, a regulatory center, whether under the Ministry of Health, uh, to really regulate and also to even give out those seeds to farmers that are willing to plant and also has continuous enforcement in terms of what they are planting, constant testing and also certain areas only they can plant. These are selected seeds. Select, selected, selected, seeds. Selected, seeds. selected seeds to maintain the quality. And then when it comes to prescription and, and dispensary, and I fully agree with my colleague there, uh, we, we cannot give all out to every, every off-the-counter kind of pharmacy. It has to be trained medical professionals and there have to be constant renewal of uh, licensing for them, maybe on a yearly basis. I'm very interested to hear what doctor mentioned just now in his medical school that they were sharing uh, marijuana on the table and I realized that I went to the wrong medical school. Thank you. <laughs> you know, doctor, we, oh, we, I come from Penang. Tansi Sharizat come from Penang, but I'm sure she does not realize she has consumed marijuana without knowing it. In Penang, <laughs> in Penang, it's not just Nasi Kanda. Every wedding, uh, the famous thing is to drop 
a muslin cloth full of marijuana into the dalcha. So you, instead of one plate, you'll whack three plates and you have a merry time the whole night. And nobody complained. <laughs> nobody complained. Yes. You, you want to ask a question? Yes. Yes, please come. Identify yourself. Okay. Hi. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Alif Shah. I'm from UIE. So I only have two questions. So one is, to what extent that we can legalize drug use in Malaysia? And is there any specific legal framework for it to be legalized? That is my question today. Okay. Um, Anybody? Volunteers? I, I only know this, that <laughs> they, all laws related to this drug issue was passed in 1952 and it still remained like that in, in most parts. That is exactly my age, which is 70 years old. But you look young. It has not changed. Yeah, I, I, I look 40. Uh, but uh, actually, you look <laughs> like so it's, it's the secret <laughs> cannabis. Uh. Are you taking on the side? Yes. <laughs> uh, I think to answer, can I just to answer your question? I think since today's uh, topic is on, on on marijuana or at least cannabis or hemp, uh, the first thing we need to do is take it out from the list, dangerous drugs list. And uh, I'm not I'm not advocating for the other drugs to be taken out the list, but I think the first step that we can take is remove it from the dangerous act. A DDA, and then we move on from there. Yeah, yeah, bro. Uh, yeah. Can I interject? Okay. So, um, in the US, in 2018, they have a US farm bill, because previously, um, the same with Malaysia, cannabis was illegal, right? And then in 2018, they have a US farm bill where they removed hemp from that legislation. So they said, uh, under US have farm bill, hemp 0.3 percent and below is legal. So perhaps uh, that's one way for us to consider to emulate these countries which have excluded ham from Akta Dadah Berbahaya. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Now uh, we are running into four, close to 4.10. Uh, I think if, if we can shut it down by 4.15, is that all right? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, Dr. Kevin has got a flight to catch, but we, we should keep as close as possible to the promised time. Uh, there is one more question. Is there? Uh, yes. Uh, all uh, right. I have a question. Two more questions or three. Okay. All right. Very quickly, can you can you post your question? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Wo Tong Ming. Uh, I'm from UM, first year law student. So uh, my question uh, was directed. Uh, I want to direct my question to the enforcement authority. Um, sorry, to who? Enforcement authority. Uh, ah, okay. SDK. SDK. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So, take no, yeah. so um, when it comes to the question whether Malaysia is ready to legalize marijuana, the first thing come into my mind is the illicit, illicit cigarette prevalence. In Malaysia, it's actually uh, 54%. And at this point, is, this data is actually in this year, 2022. And since the illegal cigarette prevalence was not really is still significant while uh, right now we are legalizing marijuana and it is infamous that Malaysia is a transit point of drug trade a drug trade and therefore um, would the how would the enforcement authority actually prevent the illicit cannabis or illicit uh, marijuana uh, from uh, spiking so this is my question first question because my opinion is that Malaysia is not ready okay other than that do you think that before the legalization of marijuana can happen or can materialize first there are about a few steps must materialize first firstly the SPRM must act fast when it comes to corruption because we know that political figures that are alleged of corruption are not actually being investigated so they are slow in acting uh, when it comes slow in investigating uh, corruption. So when it comes to PDRN, uh, the police, some uh, they are also saying that they are slow in act combating crimes, or some of them are not uh, complying with the law. For example, when there's a custodial death, inquest was not made compulsory sometimes. Well, under the law, it is compulsory. And AGC is not fully separated uh, from the government. And corruption is still very much uh, entrenched into um, 
Malaysia. So while this, all this has not been settled or come to a satisfaction level, uh, are we ready for marijuana? Then is the benefit of marijuana outweigh the risk that uh, currently we are having it? So that's my question. Thank you. Maybe we can have the second and third uh, questions and then we leave it to the panel and then we will close it. Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Thank you, YV Kelvin, for shouting out the center's data on how do Malaysians really feel about drugs. So uh, can, I'm can, you, can you take out your mask because you're muffling it? Oh, yeah. sorry. All right. Um, so I'm Javren. I'm from the center. We recently launched our report on how do Malaysians really feel about drugs. So uh, my questions really um, for Tuan Sukbeno. Yeah. Um, so I just want to know what's the update on the Drug and Substance Abuse Act that's remote to what that's supposed to replace the Drug Dependence Treatment and Rehabilitation Act, and if there's any, how does the Act balance enf enforcement towards drug misuse um, everywhere? Um, and self-medication uh, while we wait for all of these research and industrialization efforts on the drug. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And uh, the last uh, question. Okay. Um, thank you, Tantri. I'm Dr. Ravi from AADK. Um, I, I would like to pass some comment and uh, there's two questions as well. So um, we were talking about uh, TAC and CBD. Uh, I was like very surprised that a lot of people do know how to differentiate between those two things. But we need to remember one thing. If you're extracting only CBD and TSC, you're separating it in the extract, it's going to be costly. That's why all this medication which is based on the CBD is very expensive because of the extraction process. So when you are going into prescribing a extract which contains both of it, it requires the doctors who are prescribing also to notice the withdrawal symptoms. The withdrawal symptoms are those symptoms which will occur when somebody stops any addictive drugs. So if you are prescribing extracts which contain both the TSC uh, and CBD, the doctors must be equipped with the knowledge and know how to identify. Same goes to the opiates. Currently, the only way we can prevent uh, some patients getting dependent on heroin when they are given for some medical purposes is by recognizing they are having withdrawal, uh, withdrawal symptoms or not. So my question is, one to uh, YB Kelvin, how do we want to start educating for the doctors? Because not all doctors are prepared to accept this new, uh, new knowledge. It goes for any, 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 any medication. I can even quote ivermectin before this, just happened during COVID. All right. So how do we want to go uh, to advocate these doctors about this? And my second question is doctor, to Dr. Azalia. When we are doing research, looking at the medical potential, we probably need also to look at the side effect of these things. So when we are looking, we don't look only for the benefit. We also look for the what happens when a patient is prescribed a CBD. And we, I don't even want to name the rest of the 100 cannabinoids that are present in the cannabis. So we probably also need to do that as well. So what your take on that? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. Um, on the enforcement, just apa, just apa to explain to everybody, kita punya scope. ADK ni, um, kita bukannya enforcement body yang apa rate, apa supply side lah. Eh. Kita on the demand side, kita uh, kesan uh, apa addicts. Uh, uh, some of them we we will ask apa ni court to apa ni to to help us to instruct them to undergo. Uh, rehab uh, program with us, or the other, uh, and the rest, we, we will encourage them to to voluntarily come to us uh, to be treated properly. So itu kita punya ni yang uh, on the enforcement of uh, apa uh, apa uh, drug apa trafficking and so on. The one is uh, under jurisdiction of uh, uh, PDRM, uh, custom, and also uh, apa ni marine uh, APMM. So um, just untuk tu lah. So maknanya um, uh, on uh, yang mana penyeludupan apa semua uh, kita kita tak terlibat. Eh? Okay. Uh, on uh, RUU uh, the new RUU to replace uh, apa ni uh, akta penagihan dadah uh, kita 
uh, sedang dalam apa uh, more or less uh, the, the the concept the drafting and so on apa on our part kita dah dah ready kita uh, kita tengah apa uh, dapatkan apa masa untuk pihak apa inilah ministry untuk look uh, the thing thoroughly so that they can bring it to to cabinet for 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 the action lah so itu untuk ni so uh, we hope that in the future uh, we can make uh, apa ni uh, this apa uh, treatment ni more friendly uh, than sekarang sekarang ni under the the, the current law um, sebenarnya apa the second the, the repeat offender tu yang yang akan dapat punishment lah maknanya kalau kita dah treat dia kita dah rawat dia kita dah release dia dah pulih uh, katalah year 5 or year 10 di, apa dia darah ni relap kembali menagih so kalau uh, being caught by by apa ni by enforcement apa uh, authority dia akan apa nilah uh, disabitkan kesalahan dan boleh dipenjara so yang repeat offender ni uh, kalau yang first time apa ni addict ni normally apa yang kita buat uh, kita akan galakkan mereka untuk tampil secara sukarela uh, di mana-mana fasiliti yang ada di seluruh negara yang uh, being apa administer by AADK dan kita akan bagi uh, proper treatment to them lah pemulihan dan apa pada masa ini uh, kadar uh, kepulihan uh, kita boleh kata uh, around 65% lah 65% of them uh, apa pulih dan uh, currently the trend di negara kita di Malaysia uh, apa uh, synthetic drug user ni uh, around 65% of the total numbers uh, yang kita kesan annually so annually secara umumnya we have apa macam last year we uh, kita record around 128000 people uh, tapi kalau ikut formula UNODC yang itu kena time 8 kena time 8 eh uh, maknanya there is uh, every one person yang kita trace yang uh, dapatkan rawatan ada 8 lagi yang yang kat luar yang tak berkesempatan lah so there is the formula yang UNODC but last year uh, you, apa UKM dengan KDN telah buat satu prevalent study uh, apa on the youth side apa age between 15 hingga 40 uh, currently di, apa satu uh, orang yang kita rawat ada empat yang kat luar maknanya uh, kita tengok around half million people yang masih lagi apa everywhere lah di negara kita so itu secara umum dan uh, from the study also 2.5% of the population of the country pernah based on the study lah mengaku mereka pernah try at least one sekali apa satu kali sama ada marijuana ke apa yang all those thing dalam dia punya tu tapi kalau macam Tan Sri cakap tadi uh, kalau ada kenduri kahwin the whole night tu maybe the the percentage will be higher lah <laughs> kan uh, at least one time kan that is based on the study so apa yang kita nak sekarang ni adalah uh, apa uh, whatever di, macam saya kata tadi lah kita kena uh, regulate use properly supaya dia tak di misuse dan become nanti abusive lah itu yang kita kita message kita yang nak sampaikan kepada semua. Terima kasih. Yeah. Dr Nor Azilia. Okay, bye. Thank you. So, um, referring to the question by Dr Ravi, thank you for the question. Of course, um, you want to educate healthcare professionals, right? They need to know the good and the bad. Just like paracetamol, just like Tylenol, just like ibuprofen, everything comes with risk. Okay? Uh, kita bagi paracetamol to children, but people can still die from overdosing of paracetamol. Jadi betul, research, we have to look at all angles. We have to establish the good and the doctors need to know the bad, the side effects as well because they are the ones who are responsible for the patients, right? So I, I feel that I understand some of the doctors, uh, I, I read this news recently in the BBC, um, they, they allow um, CBD drugs in the UK, right? But there's this particular parent who feels that their daughter is not responsive to that particular drug. They need the kind of drug that requires a certain amount of THC. And doctors in the UK don't want to do that. They're worried. They're worried because betul, THC, um, for children, if it's high dose, it, it affects uh, development, right? Okay, so that's why you need to give these children a therapeutic dose rather. So these parent, uh, they, these parents, they have to go to Germany 
to get the particular drug. Actually been approved in Germany, but not so in the UK. So again, uh, the understanding of the side effects is very important for the doctors or the pharmacists to be confident in prescribing to these patients, let alone young children, because they're highly susceptible to the THC psychoactive effect. Right? Okay, so that's all for me. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, just to answer the question, Dr. Ravi, how do we get doctors uh, educated and empowered? Um, at the end of the day, when we were in medical school, the number one underlying rule is everything has to be evidence-based. It has to be on research data, peer-reviewed and everything. Don't, don't get me started on, on the ivermectin debate, but I think uh, that is why when it comes to policy-based, the first step is always this. We have to allow a conducive environment for research to be done. And once we've done research, then we bring in a group of doctors. Uh, voluntarily, we cannot force it. It says those that are willing to get the licensing to prescribe, this is, the, this is the indication, this is the science behind it. And then you have to renew a license on a yearly basis based on new data and research. The research world has to be more robust uh, in order for this uh, thing to be done. Uh, to, actually, just to answer the, the question given by, by the law student just now, and he mentioned that we are not ready because uh, by legalizing it, we will... We will encourage a black market, a bigger black market. Actually, it's, it's, it's a paradox. Yeah. The best way to control the black market is to legalize and to regulate. So at the end of the day, I mentioned this evidence-based, evidence-based, evidence-based. When we look at countries like Portugal and Amsterdam, the moment they legalize to a certain extent usage of, of cannabis, we actually see in empirical data the reduction of hardcore drugs, and I'm talking about heroin and stuff like that. So if we base it on that, I think that we need to take the initial steps to put policies and framework for us to look at this happening. So with that, thank you so much, Tan Sri. Uh, with that, we bring uh, to a close our uh, third forum for, this, uh, for today. Rather, uh, I want to thank, first of all, the overseas participant, uh, Steve D'Angelo, uh, Tengku Chanela Jamida, uh, Sheikh Mustafa Omar and our local participant Yang Berhormat Dr. Kelvin Yi Li Yuen Ahli Parlimen Bandar Kuching uh, Encik Sutekno Ahmad Belon Ketua Pengarah Agensi Anti Dadah Kebangsaan and uh, lastly and not least Dr. Nur Azalia Kamaruzaman Pengarah Pusat Racun Negara and all those who volunteered from the audience uh, some other experts like uh, Professor Aisha and so on. Uh, we thank you profusely for attending this session and making a lot of contribution. I, I am quite surprised that this session, or rather I shouldn't be surprised that this session is quite lively. There's a lot of benefits for us to take away. Perhaps I can end up by saying that we have learned a lot of things, but the key words for you to take home, perhaps look into the internet, and see whether you can learn a little bit more. One is the endocannabinoid system. Maybe you should look into it because you'll be astonished with what you learn from it. And what Professor Aisha said, look at the receptors in the brain. What, what does it represent in relation to uh, the, the matter under discussion now? With that, we thank you very much. Assalamualaikum and good evening to everybody. Terima kasih di atas perkongsian berilmiah sebentar tadi yang berbahagia Tan Sri dan para ahli panel diminta untuk terus berada di atas pentas. Kini majlis menjemput yang berbahagia Datuk Nur Yahati Awang, Ketua Pentadbir Parlimen Malaysia untuk naik ke atas pentas bagi menyampaikan sedikit cendera mata kenangan dari pihak Parlimen Malaysia.
Hadirin yang dihormati, tamat sudah sesi perbincangan forum ketiga dan dengan ini juga simposium kita sudah hampir ke penghujung agenda. Ucapan jutaan terima kasih jua kepada Yang Amat Berhormat Tun, Yang Berhormat Tan Sri, Datuk Sri, Datuk Datuk, Ahli-ahli yang berhormat serta hadirin sekalian di atas kesudian bersama menjayakan perbincangan ilmiah sepanjang majlis ini. Semoga sesi perkongsian daripada ahli-ahli panel melalui tajuk-tajuk yang dibincangkan sedikit sebanyak dapat memberi ilmu baharu dan manfaat kepada kita. Parlimen Malaysia sentiasa menyokong dan berusaha memberikan kesedaran dengan memberikan fakta-fakta yang tepat melalui satu platform untuk rujukan akademik serta, pengeta- serta pengeta- pengetahuan umum berkaitan isu legislatif atau semasa yang berkait rapat dengan institusi parlimen. Parlimen Malaysia mengucapkan jutaan terima kasih kepada pertubuhan alumni Rumpun Fakulti Undang-Undang Universiti Malaya atau Parfum di atas kolaborasi strategik ini dan diharapkan hubungan ini akan terus terjalin di masa akan datang. Kepada DIF-DIF kehormat, ahli yang berhormat serta hadirin, Parlimen Malaysia juga menjemput dan mengalu-alukan sumbangan penulisan artikel ke dalam jurnal Parlimen Malaysia untuk penerbitan akan datang dan maklumat lengkap boleh dirujuk melalui portal Parlimen Malaysia. Juga kepada hadirin yang ingin bersama-sama melawat ke Dewan Rakyat, diharap dapat berkumpul terus ke lobi Dewan Rakyat di tingkat 1 blok utama. Semua peserta simposium boleh juga mendapatkan e-sijil melalui kod QR berdekatan pintu masuk Dewan Banquet. Sebelum bersurai, dif-dif kehormat serta hadirin dipersilakan untuk menikmati hidangan minuman petang yang telah disediakan. Bagi pihak Parlimen Malaysia, saya memohon maaf atas sebarang kekurangan sepanjang perjalanan majlis. Sehingga kita berjumpa lagi di edisi simposium Parlimen Malaysia yang akan datang pada tahun hadapan. Sekian daripada saya, Assalamualaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh dan terima kasih.